Hello everyone, my name is José Luiz Pedroso. I am a neurologist in Brazil, <clears throat> in the Federal University of São Paulo. Today is July 14, 2022, and it's my great pleasure and an honor to interview Professor Henrique Ferraz, who is Professor of Neurology and Head of the Movement Disorders Unit in the Federal University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. And to start this interview for the International Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Society, the MDS, I would like to start with a simple question. Please, Professor Henrique Ferraz, who is Professor Henrique Ferraz? Well, first of all, thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here to, to give a report about my career. And it's a pleasure to be interviewed by you, Pedroso, who is a, a very close friend. Well, your question, who is Henrique Ferraz? Well, I am a professor of neurology. I am dedicated to teach neurology for graduate students, residents, fellows, young neurologists, and I this is my life. I like to be uh, a professor, to teach neurology to many people. And I am also a clinician and I have a, a clinical practice that I, I love a lot. Wonderful. Uh, professor Henrique, uh, I have a simple question, but it's very important uh, for our youngest neurologists and uh, for uh, our friends why did you decide to go for neurology? And particularly, why did you decide for the study and for the field of uh, movement disorders? And as well as that, uh, tell us how was the beginning of your career? Well, in the very beginning, I decided to, to study medicine when I was 17. Uh, I was in my hometown, Londrina, it's a, a town in the inner part of Brazil. At that time, when I decided to study medicine, 1975, uh, the town had 300,000 inhabitants, and I decided to go for medicine. I had a, a role model, model in my home, there was, I lived with uh, an uncle and my grandparents, and my uncle was a neurosurgeon. He was a very kind uncle, he was very charismatic, and my decision was mainly based in his, the way he was. And I had a, a brother, I have a brother, that decided to study medicine as well before me, uh, and that the decision of my brother spurred me on to medicine. And then I decided to go for medicine. And I entered the college in 1975, and I finished my graduation in 1980. And my first, de my first decision to wha what I would work with after the graduation was, my, my intention was to be a general practitioner. But when I was at the end of the college, uh, right, uh, right uh, to receive my degree of doctor, I was uh, not completely comfortable to go for a small community to be a general practitioner. I was really not comfortable because I, 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 I feel that I have to, to study a little bit more, to have more experience, and then I decided to to go for internal medicine, and then I passed the exams to be a resident in internal medicine in the same university in my hometown, Londrina. And then I started internal medicine, and in the second year of my residence, I, I rotated in neurology, and I became fascinated by the way my professors uh, construct the, 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 the diagnosis using elements of the anatomy and semiology. That fascinated me. And then 
my decision, yes, I, I believe I will be a neurologist. And that, that I had my uncle who was a neurosurgeon and my brother who also was uh, training to be a neurosurgeon and I, well, I would be a neurologist. And then I decided to go to Sao Paulo to Escola Paulista de Medicina, the Federal University of Sao Paulo, where I work today, to go for uh, the residency in neurology. And that was my, my, my life until that time. I entered in, uh, Escola Paulista de Medicina in 1982, 1983, sorry, and I became fascinated by the atmosphere of the university, Federal University of Sao Paulo. Uh, the academic life there, it's really amazing. And I became interested in the academic life and that was my decision to be a, a professor and to start the academic career. Thank you, Professor Henrique, for <clears throat> sharing with uh us this amazing history and um, this is a very interesting question that I would like to do uh, because you know that uh, our mentors our professors are part of our academic life we learn so much with them and uh, my question is which professors or mentors inspired you during your uh, undergraduate and postgraduate and who was your mentor and how uh, did that motive you to move on the academic journey and scientific work along the years in the field of uh, movement disorders well i have i have had a lot of uh, inspiring professors in londrina and in Escola Paulista de Medicina, Federal University of São Paulo, but two inspired me most. Uh, the first one was Professor Eliova Zuckerman, who was a professor of neurology at Federal University of São Paulo. He was a very, very good clinician. He inspired me a lot because he had a very keen perception of the patients, he, he was good in on making diagnosis and thinking about the process of the disease of the patient. And he was always very supportive with the issues of my career. And every time I, I, I brought him my problems, the, the questions that I have raised in my career, he was always very supportive. Unfortunately, he passed away six years ago, and I miss him a lot. The other professor who inspired me, he is my mentor, uh, is Professor Luis Augusto Andrade. He worked in uh, Escola Paulista de Medicina at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. Uh, at that time, he was, he is one of the founders of movement disorders in Brazil, together with Professor Egberto Barbosa of the other University in Sao Paulo, University of Sao Paulo, Professor Barbosa, and Luis Augusto at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. He was at that time, 1983, 4 and 5, he was starting and spreading the knowledge of movement disorders around Brazil. He was traveling a lot, giving lectures, training other people in other universities in Brazil. And he was a very good professor. He, he knew a lot of, uh, of the medicine and the neurology as a whole. And he was starting movement disorders. And that fascinated me. And I started a fellowship with him in 1985. At that time, he had had three other fellows before me, but none of them decided to stay with him. And I was the only uh, doctor with him at that time. And I had a lot of work to do because I was alone with him. And he traveled a lot at that time. He was traveling a lot, uh, giving lectures and other universities. 
and in meetings and congress uh, and i had to to deal with the patients to to prepare classes and to 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 go for clinical rounds with the residents and it was a, a very fruitful time for me and i learned a lot and i had almost uh, when he was in sao paulo uh, every day we had discussions with the patients uh, I, i used to show him the the videos of the patients discuss the diagnosis the treatments it was really very very good for me because i i, I learned a lot with him and uh, at that time uh i i was his fellow for two years it is uh, 1985 until 1987 and then right after i started to my postgraduate uh, stu- studies with uh, my master degree i uh, i i i got my master degree at 1990 and my phd in 1992 yes uh, <clears throat> in fact <clears throat> professor uh, luis augusto franco de andrade and professor egberto reis barbosa the found, founders of um, uh, movement disorders uh, in brazil they uh, contribute a lot i had the the, the great opportunity to uh, learn with them and particularly highlighting the the phenomenology in movement disorders the clinical features and it's very important for uh movement the study of movement movement disorders and, yeah so at that time and i stay with him as his fellow and then after his postgraduate student and then his colleague for 12 years and unfortunately professor andrade retired from academic life in 1997 mm-hmm. and i regret a lot for his early retirement and i was with him at that time when he decided his retirement and i was i could say that i was in the right place in the right time because i took it over after him but i believe that i would be better if i w- would be with him all this time and i have uh, i i i am with him very frequently nowadays but he's only in his private life but we talk a lot and we exchange information all yeah. the time you were very lucky to have yeah. uh, two uh, great professors great mentors um another question to talk about your uh, research activities which were your first research uh-huh. activities in the university and what are those studies you consider the most relevant in your scientific career okay well the first studies that i have carried out i believe well when i was starting my fellowship with uh, professor andrade he first asked me to organize the files and the videos of the patients and at that time 1980 5 so dystonia had been recently defined and classified by Fan Marsden and Kahn and he asked me please organize the, the file of patients of dystonia and then i decided to to go over the the files to the records too the, many patients too many <laughs> yes more than 100 <laughs> patients and i had to organize them and then we decided to to write it down the, the all the The, the files the, the the records of the patients and was it in the computer or <laughs> no it was <laughs> in the typewriter <laughs> that occasion the computer was okay. starting <laughs> in our lives and then we published uh, the idiopathic cases it was almost 80 patients we published here in brazil in archives in neuropsychiatria it was a very nice a report of the cases and we published the symptomatic case of dystonias with thorough uh, exams and f- uh, record records in Canadian Journal of Neurology in 1990 I believe 
this was one of the first activities in my research career. And at that time, uh, simultaneously, Professor Andrade came up with the idea of studying patients who we had seen at that occasion coming from a region next to Sao Paulo, uh, and a rural area next to Sao Paulo, or of this green belt of Sao Paulo, producing vegetables and other products that came with uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, patients were very young, around 30 years of age. Two patients from the same regions, they were not related to each other, uh, that they were involved in tomato plantation. And then Professor Andrade uh, asked which kind of uh, pesticide they use, and they provide the names of the pesticides. And then there was a, a pesticide that contained manganese in its formulation. And then Andrade made the relationship where manganese and Parkinsonism, maybe there is a relationship. And then we decided to study the, the region to go to carry out a, an epidemiological study in that region next to Sao Paulo. And we studied a court of individuals working with uh, the plantation, spreading the pesticide. They used no protection, no gloves, no masks to, to spread the, the pesticides. And we compared to a control group of patients of the same area who were involved in the truck loading of the production not with not uh, contact with the pesticide. And we was able to, to find that the individuals of the exposed group, they had mild signs of uh, uh, manganese intoxication. They have nervousness, insomnia, some behavioral abnormalities, tremor, postural tremor, and some had some rigidity. rigidity. And we, we guessed that there was mild, uh, in mild signs of uh, manganese intoxication, but we could not see any Parkinson's disease patients in that cohort of, of individuals. And curiously, curiously, the, the two index patients with Parkinsonism, they developed a disease which was really Parkinson's disease. One of them uh, brought his uh, younger brother with Parkinson's symptoms. Maybe it was a genetic cause of Parkinsonism. And maybe they were not manganese intoxication patients, they were really Parkinson's disease patients. But it was. Yes, very interesting history about your first uh, studies. And uh, to, to finish the, this question, uh, what is your opinion now? Is, is there a space to think that uh, uh, the etiology of Parkinson's disease, the idiopathic Parkinson's disease, could be related to some kind of occupational profession or maybe some kind of poisoning or intoxication? Uh, what, uh -huh. what is the conclusion? Do you still think yeah. that there is a relationship? Well, there was, there was a lot of debate about this issue since then. Um, yeah, sure, there is a, a relationship. Uh, we don't know if it's a, a direct relationship between pesticide and Parkinson's disease, but it's a risk factor. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. That was a very interesting yeah. uh, epidemiological study. Congratulations. And to move on with our interview, uh, everybody knows that you have a huge contribution in the field of uh, movement disorders, uh, particularly in uh, the study of Parkinson's disease. And um, how do you see the future of uh, therapeutic approaches for Parkinson's disease? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that huge as you say. <laughs> But we have some contributions in the literature. Very important contributions. <laughs> well, I don't believe so, but there are some. Uh, we have published a lot of our research in, in, for instance, in imaging and movement disorders, in Parkinson's disease, uh, 
especially uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, we have some contributions in genetics, in Parkinsonism and dystonia, uh, in Huntington's disease. Well, there is some contribution. And, but we have uh, also uh, we have also studies with uh, rehabilitation in movement disorders, diseases. Well, but I believe, and I'm proud of it, that I have trained a lot of people as fellows, more than 30 fellows, 25 or 28 uh, postgraduate students. These are my, I have, I'm proud of that, and I have trained a lot of people and this is, I believe this is important for our work. Uh, and for the future, you are asking me about the future. It's a very hard question to, to answer. There's a lot of things that we must develop for the patients. But I believe the main gap that we have nowadays is to have a reliable biomarker of Parkinson's disease. This is crucial to to, to develop new treatments, especially disease-modifying treatments that it's lacking in our, in our science. And I believe to develop a real, reliable biomarker, it's urgent. Yes, perfect. Um, I have a difficult question now, because we talked a lot about um, many good things, uh, many uh, contributions, your history, but everybody knows that during, during our academic life, we have some difficulties, some challenges. And my question is, what were the main obstacles and challenges in your career? Uh, this is a good question. We have many obstacles during the career. But I believe that, we, and you know, you are Brazilian like me, that the most uh, drawback that we face all the time in Brazil is funding. We have lack of funding here in Brazil. It's a, a, a real problem for our uh, science. And especially, I I'm really believe that this is a real obstacle. It's uh, scholarships, for, especially for doctors who are clinicians who decide to go for a clinical research science. We cannot get uh, scholarships here in Brazil because uh, the government say, oh, you are doctors, you may have money yes. uh, working <laughs> in emergency <laughs> rooms and outpatient <laughs> clinics. We, you, you don't need the scholarships and, and no one can dedicate his life for clinical research if they don't have the money. Totally so yeah, it's, it's difficult, difficult to, to, to make it compatible with your private life as a doctor and your clinical research career. And mainly because our, the, most, the, the vast majority of our patients are in public care. So. Sure. Sure, it's it's yeah. a challenge for it's a, for the in, especially in developing countries. In Brazil, it's facing uh, the problems of funding yes. nowadays. Yeah, we have a lot of problems. I this. totally agree with you. We could be better if we, we if we had more money. Yes, <laughs> totally agree. Uh, you have uh, provided a relevant scientific contribution for MDS over the last decades. And uh, besides MDS-PAS, the Pan-American, uh, what were the most relevant contributions to MDS since the beginning of your career? Well, in fact, I would say that I have two fronts of working in movement disorders. I, I have, a, a, here in Brazil, I have worked with uh, the society in Brazil, the uh, Brazilian Academy of Neurology as uh, organizing meetings and seminars and spreading the knowledge of movement disorders. I have been 
director of the, the scientific department of movement disorders of Brazilian Academy of Neurology for two times, twice, uh, since 2001. And I worked a lot in this issue. I contributed to many congress and asking people for coming to Brazil to, to give lectures and to invite our colleagues from Brazil to, to participate in the Congress. And this is uh, very important, I believe. It's a, I believe it's a contribution of myself to movement disorders. And, and I became uh, part of the board of directors of the Brazilian Academy of Neurology, as you are nowadays. Uh, I've been for 80 years uh, part of the board of directors of the Brazilian Academy. I believe that I contribute to spread movement disorders here in Brazil. And in the international uh, society, in MDS, I've been elected for uh, the executive board of PAS, Pan-American Section of Movement Disorders, in, two, in 2015 and I've been of the executive committee for six years uh, until recently. And I was the chair of the PAS for two years. And it was, uh, it was a great pleasure to work with nice people. Uh, MDS has, as you know, a great secretariat, yes. help, help us a lot to develop our activities and we very organize, yeah, very professional. They are very good in their work. And I believe that uh, we have done a great work due to them and to our colleagues. I was succeeded by Cindy Comella in the PAS section and now by Susan Fox. They both have done a great work in the society, they are still doing great work and we are growing up on and on. And I believe it's, yes. it's good for our society. A relevant work, yeah. a wonderful work. And I hope to, to, to still contribute to our society in the coming years. But, but considering MDS, I still have a final question. Mm -hmm. I have heard that you have been in all Congress, all international yeah. Congress. <laughs> Is it yeah, true? Yeah. Uh, uh, from 1998, I have been maybe to all except one or one, maybe. I. Yes, this is wonderful. Yeah, I, I participate all the Congress Fantastic. since then. And I have a lot of friends, uh, very good friends of the International Society. And I am very happy to meet them in the Congress. <laughs> really very fantastic. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, Professor Enrique Ferraz, I have a final question. I believe that not the most important question, but uh, for me, uh, that uh, I was lucky to be your resident almost 20 years ago. And uh, I have to mention this, uh, uh, or, uh, you were the mentor of a Professor Orlando Barsottini who was my mentor. So yeah. it's a very interesting uh, relationship between us. And I was lucky to, to be your resident uh, 20 years ago. And I still learn a lot with you as a professor of neurology in the field of movement disorders. We have some awards together, some research together. And uh, so uh, I would like to highlight how important uh, you are and you are an inspiration for many residents and neurologists, not only in Brazil, but in Latin America and worldwide. So my last question is to conclude, what are the main lessons that you would like to let uh, for your students, firstly? And on the other hand, what have you learned from them. Yeah. Well, thank you for your words. You are very kind. And it's a pleasure to, to be with you and still discussing our cases and exchange information. We learn a lot with each other. Thank you for 
your kind words? Well, of course, uh, the first and old professor are very important and a perennial inspiration for us ever. But we have, uh, I believe that our students, residents, fellows, are the light that direct us to new knowledge. And I believe it's very important to be with the young people uh, because they, they really teach us a lot because they, uh, they ask us about new things that we are not thinking about. And then I believe I learn a lot with them and that's the main lesson that I, I have from them. And you think that uh, what I would say to my students, my fellows, uh, I, I believe it's important that if you want to, to, to pursue a, a clinical research activity in your life, in your academic life, you must, you, you never have to give up to seeing patients. It's important to, to see patients, to assist them, to... To be a good clinician. To be a good clinician. <laughs> this is decisive to be a good clinical research uh, professional. And I believe, and I would always say to them, stay in the clinics, still stay seeing your patients, uh, it's important when you are going to teach your future students. It's important. It's a great pleasure for me to be in this life, to still be in with young people, uh, exchanging information. It's for me, it's uh, very important. Wonderful. So um, I am very delighted to have the opportunity to interview Professor Henrique Ferraz, who was my professor and professor of many neurologists and residents in Brazil. It was a great pleasure, a great honor. It was a fantastic interview. I hope that um, all members of uh, MDS enjoy this interview. And I hope we meet ourselves in Madrid in September in the International yeah, Congress. I hope so. Thank you very much. It was thank, my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the MDS for the invitation.